Okay, Daniel chapter 1. I am reading out of um, NIV next week. Before we gather together, if you guys could all have Daniel chapter 2 read through before you come here. And again, I, I kind of ask you, read it in as many different translations as possible. It's always helpful to get many translations on your app. By the way, the G, um, GW, God's Word, it's a great translation just for getting a feel. Um, I like that translation, okay? All right, so the NIV, here we go. Daniel chapter 1. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. And these he carried off to the temple of his God in Babylonia and put in the treasure house of his God. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, chief of his court officials, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility, young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language and literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that they were to enter the king's service. And among these were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. The chief official gave them new names to Daniel, the name Belshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine, and he asked the chief official for permission not to defile himself this way. Now God had caused the official to show favor and sympathy to Daniel, but the official told Daniel, I am afraid of my lord, the king, who has assigned your food and drink. Why should he see you looking worse than the other young men your age? The king would then have my head because of you. Daniel then said to the guard whom the chief official had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your servants for 10 days. Give us nothing but vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then compare our appearance with that of the young men who eat the royal food and treat your servants in accordance with what you see. So he agreed to this and tested them for 10 days. And at the end of the 10 days, they looked healthier and better nourished than any of the young men who ate the royal food. So the guard took away their choice food and the wine they were to drink and gave them vegetables instead. To these four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And Daniel could understand visions and dreams of all kinds. At the end of the time set by the king to bring them in, the chief official presented them to Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and he found none equal to Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's service in every matter of wisdom and understanding about the, which the king questioned them. He found them ten times better than all the magicians and enchanters in the whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. Wow. Incredible opening. In the first verse of Daniel, two cities are named, Jerusalem and Babylon. The Bible is truly a tale of two cities. There are many cities, of course, listed in the Word of God. But these two cities are the most significant. All other cities in Scripture, or in any part of human history for that matter, derive their character from one of these two cities and will be judged in the light of those two cities, Jerusalem and Babylon. But also, in the first two verses, is provided the entire historical setting for chapters 1 through 6. These first six chapters are full of the miraculous, as we're going to see. And it's really basically pretty easy to understand. Whereas the last six chapters are full of prophecy and are difficult to understand, as we will also see. Now, the language Daniel, the book of Daniel, is written in is both Hebrew and Aramaic, or in the Chaldean language of that time. The first chapter, though, is in Hebrew, and the next five are in Aramaic. But then you get to the second half of the book, and chapter 7, the first chapter of the second half, is written in Aramaic, and then the next five are in Hebrew. So there's a pattern there. So, so Hebrew, Aramaic, and then uh, Aramaic and Hebrew. 
Isn't that weird? That's, that's just kind of a, a funny pattern. And it appears that the chapters were directed toward particular readers. The Aramaic chapter is written for the world audience, while those in Hebrew were meant especially for the Jews. Now, to lay a very important foundation for the current situation that we just read in verses 1 and 2, it is imperative, imperative to keep in mind that the Lord gave, the Lord delivered the king of Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, it says there, I read it, it said, the Lord delivered. I think the, the King James Version says the Lord gave um, Yehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand. In other words, what I'm kind of highlighting here is the Lord arranged this, not just allowed it. Now, that might seem a bit like splitting hairs, but sometimes the Lord actively does something, and other times he passively allows something to happen. Can we know the difference? Can we know when the Lord brings some, something actively about or when he just allows something passively? And I believe the answer to that question is a resounding yes. Here's the difference. When God announces beforehand that he intends to do something, then that is God arranging, yeah. delivering, giving over, bringing, whatever it is you want to say. It's God actively causing a situation. Now, how can I back that up? Amos was told this. Surely the sovereign Lord does nothing without revealing his plan to his servants, the prophets. So the Lord never does anything without first revealing that plan to the prophets. Let me give you a modern day example that has been argued about. 9-11. There have been a lot of leaders, one which is Pat Robertson, who has said, God brought 9-11. That was judgment on America. I can't agree with him on that because 9-11 was never prophesied. Right. I do believe God allowed it. Yeah. But he did not cause it because there was no revelation brought to America before mm -hmm. to us that that was going to be carried out. Well, can you give me another example of when he did? Yeah, Noah's flood. That was revealed beforehand, and then God brought it. What would be another one? The destruction of Nineveh. He says, mm -hmm. I'm going to do it, and it was revealed by Nahum. Mm -hmm. Okay, 150 years after Jonah. And here, in this situation, in the book of Daniel, regarding Judah, it was revealed that God was going to bring the Babylonians, and it was revealed from many prophets. Now, remember, the consistent theme that runs through the book of Daniel is that God gives, that's their active word again, God gives the kingdom to whomsoever he will. And that message is still relevant today. And it's important for the people of God, us, to keep in mind at all times. It's an unchanging message that works in the Old Testament, and it gets through the filter of the cross into the New Testament. Anyways, the point is God brought Nebuchadnezzar to Judah. Why? Was it because Nebuchadnezzar was a good guy? No, he was a tyrant. He loved to gouge people's eyes out. He loved to roast men alive. He was far from being a good man. God gave Nebuchadnezzar this victory because the king of Judah, Zedekiah, was a bad man. And the leaders of Judaism were bad men. And the people of God were bad too. The Lord had warned them for years about their behavior. The, the Lord said, if you continue in this way, you're going to have to leave this land. You know what? Israel never took God seriously. They didn't listen to him. So the Lord was driven to the very end of his patience with them. And he said, that's it. Let's go to 2 Chronicles 36. 2 Chronicles 36. Uh, 
know, doing the one year reading, we're in Ezekiel. Yeah. Isn't this what you know they're talking about? They, yeah. Yep. They're yeah. Talking That's exactly about the right thing. Yes. yes. Warning. Like, yeah. Yes. Warning. Yep. This this not. Gonna exactly. Happen. We're going to read out of Ezekiel tonight. Yeah. Yes. Okay. We might hit that same passage. Okay, starting in verse 15, it says, The Lord, the God of their fathers, sent word to them through his messengers again and again because he had pity on his people and on his dwelling place. But they mocked God's messengers, despised his words, and scoffed at his prophets until the wrath of the Lord was aroused against his people. And there was no remedy. He brought up against them the king of the Babylonians who killed their young men with a sword in the sanctuary and spared neither young man nor young woman, old man or aged. God handed all of them over to Nebuchadnezzar. He carried to Babylon all the articles from the temple of God, both large and small, and the treasures of the Lord's temple and the treasures of the king and his officials. They set fire to God's temple and broke down the wall of Jerusalem. They burned all the palaces and destroyed everything of value there. He carried into exile to Babylon the remnant who escaped from the sword, and they became servants to him and his sons until the kingdom of Persia came to power. The land enjoyed its Sabbath rests all the time of its desolation it rested until the 70 years were completed in fulfillment of the word of the Lord spoken by Jeremiah. That last verse, 21, remember that. We will get to that tonight. I'm going to talk about that, okay? Mm -hmm. So God chose the king of Babylon to deal with his people. Thus he gave Nebuchadnezzar victory over them. Now, we have learned in the past in detail the reason for Israel's captivity of the two houses of the two kingdoms of Israel. The northern kingdom called Israel was exiled by Assyria in 721 BC. But about 100 years later, God directed Babylon to invade the southern kingdom, which was named Judah. Babylon did this, but they did it in three different phases. In the first invasion, around 606 BC, Daniel was a teenager, probably somewhere between the ages of 17 to 20, and he, along with other royalty, was taken back to Babylon. The second invasion was around 598 BC, and in this phase, Ezekiel, at this point, the prophet, he was a young man, and he was taken in the second invasion back to Babylon. Also, what was taken in the second invasion were the sacred vessels from the temple of the Lord, from Solomon's temple. Now, the third invasion was 586 or so BC, and in this last invasion, the king of Judah, Zedekiah, was taken. The temple, Solomon's temple, was totally destroyed. Jerusalem, God's city, was ransacked. Most of the people of Judah were taken captive, with only a few poor ones left behind, and the land was desolated. And when Nebuchadnezzar gained total victory, do you think he paused and said, oh, thank you, Lord, for giving me the victory? Okay. No, he didn't. He had absolutely no fear of the Lord. He said, their God is nothing, my God is everything. And Nebuchadnezzar, that victory signified the end of the dynasty of the Davidic throne over Judah and Jerusalem understand that there since that time what we read there has never been a king over the house of judah since then they have ceased to be a monarchy or a theocracy and it is right here under king nebuchadnezzar king of babylon that you've heard the phrase the times of the gentiles about which christ spoke in luke 21 began this was the beginning of the times of the gentiles because God gives the kingdom to whomsoever he will. He gave the kingdom over to the Gentiles. And that began establishing the times of the Gentiles. Which means for Israel that the scepter had departed from Judah 600 years before Shiloh. Shiloh is a name that points to Christ. And for the Jewish mind, that made absolutely no sense because God told Jacob, when he prophesied over his boys in Genesis 49, that the scepter will not depart from Judah. So for the Jewish mind, they said, wait a minute, wait a minute, where's the scepter? What about, where's the throne of David? And what about Shiloh taking the throne? And all would be answered in the Lord's time. 
Now, scripture is incredibly clear as to why the Lord brought the Babylonians to Judah. Here's why, in short. The Lord made a covenant with Israel. And every covenant ever made by God always has a sign linked with it. Always. The Abrahamic covenant. What is the sign of the Abrahamic covenant? Circumcision. Okay. The Mosaic covenant. What is its sign? It is Sabbath. Shabbat. That is the sign of the Mosaic covenant. Okay. Now. The Lord's Sabbaths, and they are plural, were given to Israel as a sign between them and him. Israel was to keep all of the Lord's Sabbaths because that's the sign of the Mosaic Covenant. The weekly Sabbath, the land Sabbath, which is every seven years, and there was also a jubilee sabbath which is every 50th year okay let's look at that let's go to leviticus 25. now remember this is the sabbath is the sign of the mosaic covenant wait leviticus 25. uh-huh and oh it should be we should be following right along in in our yeah, Leviticus 25, the reason for captivity, letter B. You see that? I've got the scriptures listed out for you there. Okay? And it says this, Do not reap what grows of itself or harvest the grapes of your intended vines. The land is to have a year of rest. Whatever the land yields during the Sabbath year will be food for you, for yourself, your manservant and maidservant and the hired worker and temporary resident who live among you as well as for your livestock and the wild animals in your land. Whatever the land produces may be eaten or whatever the land produces in that year by itself, that may be eaten, but you're not to plant or to till the ground and plant and harvest and reap, okay? And that was right there in Leviticus, okay? And that was on the seventh year? Every seventh year, every seventh. Now let's go to Jeremiah 17. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Lamentations is on anybody. Okay, so Jeremiah 17, verse 20. Okay, so Jeremiah 17, and this is what it says. <laughs> this is Jeremiah the prophet being told by God what to say to them. Say to them, Hear the word of the Lord, O kings of Judah, and all people of Judah, and every one living in Jerusalem who come through these gates. This is what the Lord says. Be careful not to carry a load on the Sabbath day or bring it through the gates of Jerusalem. Do not bring a load out of your houses or do any work on the Sabbath, but keep the Sabbath day holy as I commanded your forefathers. Yet they did not listen or pay attention. They were stiff-necked and would not listen or respond to discipline. But if you are careful to obey me, declares the Lord, and bring no load through the gates of this city on the Sabbath, but keep the Sabbath day holy by not doing any work on it, then kings who sit on David's throne will come through the gates of this city with their officials. They and their officials will come riding in chariots and on horses, accompanied by men of Judah and those living in Jerusalem, and the city will be inhabited forever. People will come from the towns of Judah and the villages around Jerusalem, from the territory of Benjamin and the western foothills, from the hill country and the Negev, bringing burnt offerings and sacrifices, grain offerings, incense, thank offerings to the house of the Lord. But if you do not obey me to keep the Sabbath day holy by not carrying any load as you come through the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I will kindle an unquenchable fire in the gates of Jerusalem that will consume her fortresses. Wow. And that's what happened. Now let's go to the next scripture, Ezekiel 20. So keep going to the right. Ezekiel 20, starting in verse 10. And we're going to read through 24. <clears throat> and it says, Therefore, this is God speaking, I led them out of Egypt and brought them into the desert. I gave them my decrees and made note to them my laws. 
for the man who obeys them will live by them. Also, I gave them my Sabbaths as a sign. See, there it is. It's a sign of the covenant between us so they would know that I, the Lord, made them holy. Yet the people of Israel rebelled against me in the desert. They did not follow my decrees but rejected my laws. Although the man who obeys them will live by them. And they utterly desecrated my, not Sabbaths, but my Sabbaths. See the plural there? Mm -hmm. So I said, I will pour out my wrath on them and destroy them in the desert. But for the sake of my name, I did what would keep it from being profaned in the eyes of the nations in whose sight I had brought them out. Also with uplifted hand, I swore to them in the desert that I would not bring them into the land I had given them, a land flowing with milk and honey, most beautiful of all lands, because they rejected my laws and did not follow my decrees and desecrated my Sabbaths. Again, plural. For their hearts were devoted to their idols. Yet I looked on them with pity and did not destroy them or put an end to them in the desert. I said to their children in the desert, do not follow the statutes of your fathers or keep their laws or defile yourselves with their idols. I am the Lord your God. Follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. Keep my Sabbaths. Notice the plural there. Holy. That they may be a sign between us. <coughs> then you will know that I am the Lord your God. But the children rebelled against me. They did not follow my decrees. They were not careful to keep my laws, although the man who obeys them will live by them. And they desecrated my Sabbaths. So I said I would pour out my wrath on them and spend my anger against them in the desert. But I withheld my hand, and for the sake of my name, I did what would keep it from being profaned in the eyes of the nation in whose sight I had brought them out. And also with uplifted hand, I swore to them in the desert that I would disperse them among the nations and scatter them through the countries because they had not obeyed my laws but had rejected my decrees and desecrated my Sabbaths. And their eyes lusted after their father's idols. Okay, so it's established about the Sabbaths. Not only that it's a sign of the Mosaic Covenant, like circumcision is the sign of the Abrahamic Covenant, but also that they desecrated him. They had been violated, every one of them. The children of Israel, they neglected the Sabbath days, the Sabbath years, which became the ground for divine punishment. For 490 years, they failed to keep the land Sabbaths, which is every seven years. So 490 divided by seven mm -hmm. equals 70. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the Babylonian <clears throat> captivity would be for that period of time because God was going to see to it that his land could enjoy the Sabbaths and get the Sabbaths. Now it's interesting to know, if you take 490 years and go backwards from the point of the Babylonian invasion backwards, you know where it lands you in, his, in Israel's history? To the first king of Israel, which was Saul, which is really sad. So he became king and they kept, they started from following Saul's, the Sabbath. From Saul's yeah. point on, they didn't follow the land of Sabbaths. Mm -hmm. Isn't that something? Yeah. Didn't David didn't even keep That them means up. David didn't That's keep them just, either. Wow. Yeah. Wow. They neglected for 490 years the land Sabbaths. You know, we just read that they neglected, like, uh, sorry, they neglected the Sabbaths in the desert before they got into the promised land, mm -hmm. right? But they, they de neglected the, the weekly Sabbaths and the festival Sabbaths and all that, but not the land Sabbaths because they weren't in the land. Once they got in the land, Moses had told them about it. And it was written in Leviticus. We've, we've read about it. So the Lord gave the prophet Jeremiah the duration of their punishment or captivity, and it was to last for 70 years. Go back to Jeremiah 25. We're going to really know our Old Testament, how to get where we need to go, if you've got your regular Bible after, because we're going to always use our Bible. Like I said, it's going to be more of a, a, a study like this. Okay, so 25.8. Uh, 
this is what it, um, therefore the Lord Almighty says this, because you have not listened to my words, I will summon all the peoples of the north and my servant Nebuchadnezzar. Can you believe that? He's calling Nebuchadnezzar his servant. King of Babylon declares the Lord, and I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants and against all the surrounding nations. I will completely destroy them and make them an object of horror and scorn and an everlasting ruin. This is to his own people. I will banish from them the sounds of joy and gladness, the voices of the bride and bridegroom, the sound of millstones and the light of the lamps. This whole country will become a desolate wasteland and these nations will serve the king of Babylon 70 years. But when the 70 years are fulfilled, I will punish the king of Babylon and his nation, mm -hmm. the land of the Babylonians for their guilt, declares the Lord, and will make it desolate forever. I will bring upon that land all the things I have spoken against it, all that are written in this book and prophesied by Jeremiah against all the nations. They themselves will be enslaved by many nations and great kings. I will repay them according to their deeds and the work of their hands. Wow. So the law given to Moses for the people of Israel specifically stated that the land was not theirs. The land was his land. Israel was to keep the laws of God's land. Thus he would bless the nation accordingly. After all, he is the Lord of the land or the landlord. That's what we need to think of him as. The earth belongs to him. He is the landlord. He doesn't want it polluted with physical pollution or spiritual pollution. But we have. And we see how God looks at his land as being the landlord. Okay? That gives God the right, since he is the landlord of the land, to have laws about how people live in his land. This isn't just for Israelites in the promised land that he gave them. Mm -hmm. Because listen, God foretold, well, God foretold the Israelites that if they failed to keep his laws and keep the land holy, you know what he would do? He would spew them out of the land just like he spewed the Canaanites and cleared the Canaanites out of the land for them to get into the land. Why did he spew the Canaanites out of the land? because of their many, many, many abominations. He didn't just say, well, you're good to the land and I'm gonna kick you people out because I'm gonna make that for my people, the Israelites. He had given them chance after chance after chance. And he told Abraham that way back in Genesis 15, that he was going to give them a chance to do it right. But guess what? Those Canaanites polluted the land. So he allowed them to be kicked out and Israel got to come in. Now Israel becomes worse than the Canaanites. It's his land. And in Leviticus, chapter 26, you can go there. The Lord spoke of the seven times punishment and plagues that would come on the nation for violating his land and the breaking of the Sabbaths. Very serious stuff. And we go to Leviticus 26. I think it's listed in your... Uh, did I list that in your? Yes. yes. Yeah. Okay, good. So just follow that. We're going to go Leviticus 26. Let's see, verse 18. It says this. This is the law now. This is the very center of Torah. Wait, you have 31 to 35. Uh, no, first do Leviticus 26. I don't have that in there anywhere. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's 31 to 35. Oh, sorry. Okay. We, you might want to put these down. Sorry, I missed that. 18, verse 18 first. And then verse 21. And then verse 24. Okay. okay, verse 18 says this. If after all this you will not listen to me, I will punish you for your sins seven times over. I will break down your stubborn pride and make the sky above you like iron and the ground beneath you like bronze. Okay. That's pretty clear. Yeah, right? Go up to 21, verse 21. If you remain hostile toward me and refuse to listen to me, I will multiply your afflictions seven times over as your sins deserve. And go to verse 24. I myself will be hostile toward you and will afflict you for your sins seven times over. So that we've established that, mm -hmm. right? Seven times over. Okay, now 
in the Torah, which we're in the middle of right now. This is Leviticus is the very center of Torah. There's five books of Torah, and Leviticus is the center of it. So it's the heart of it, okay? In the Torah, the Lord spoke of, and I'm going to say this tonight, and we're going to revisit this a lot, especially in the prophecy of the last time. So we're going to, it's all going to come together, and I want to remember this. You might want to put a star by it. He spoke of a fourfold desolation, and we're going to introduce that theme, the fourfold desolation, tonight. Okay? And that is in this chapter, and... It would be a fourfold desolation that would come on the nation for neglecting his Sabbaths. Again, plural. Now, Webster defines desolate or desolation as devoid of inhabitants, deserted, abandoned, barren, and of course, joyless. So it's not a good word, right? All right. So there would be four desolations, and I have them written out, obviously, under number two. There would be desolation of the city and cities, the sanctuaries, the land, and the people. Let's read verse 31, the beginning of 31. Where is it? There it is. He says, I will turn your cities into ruins. That's the first thing he said. So that's the first part of the fourfold desolation. The cities of Judah, as well as Jerusalem, was desolated under King Nebuchadnezzar. Here's the sad thing. If Judah had just obeyed his laws, then the city would have remained forever. Okay? Then, what's the next desolation? Of the sanctuaries. Continue on in that verse. And lay waste your sanctuary. Sanctuaries. And I will take no delight in the pleasing aroma of your offerings. Wow. See, that's what they thought. Living in Judah, even though the northern kingdom had been exiled by Assyria, they treated Solomon's temple, the house of God, like a good luck charm or a safety net. God would never destroy his temple. But if they would have read their Torah and paid attention to it, yeah. they would have seen that I'll even allow my temple to be destroyed. Talk about stiff necked, right? And that's what happened. Uh, the temple and the sacred places of Judah were made desolate under King Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel was taken to Babylon just prior to that desolation. Yeah. Um, what? So, as you're talking, it just reminds me, obviously, it reminds all of us of here and now. Yeah. Um, and immediately I just think of why would they not listen and why would they, you know, not read the, they just, there's no fear of God. Right. So, but in the beginning, there was a lot of fear of God, you know, in the beginning of, you know, God setting up his law and all these things. So is it, go back again on the rabbis or the, you know, you not, know not that the people, the people, you know, the people didn't have the Torah, right? For no. the most part. They, you know, they ever since it. God sent Moses, even when they were caught in Egypt, before the plagues were sent and before God delivered them out of Egypt, mm -hmm. God told Moses to tell the people, get rid of your idols. They didn't even then. And then after they were delivered out of Egypt and brought to the mountain of God, and they said, we will, and they entered covenant, right, yeah. they immediately started disobeying the Lord. They said, all right, he brought them to the edge of the promised land, and we know what happened there. They were stiff-necked the whole time. Yeah. They were stiff-necked. And no that's fear what, of God. That's no fear point. of God. Remember, they're chosen for service, not salvation. Mm -hmm. And the big key to remember is God doesn't need all of them to get his will accomplished. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so, uh, we need to be so sensitive to the word and to spirit. Mm -hmm. He means business. They yeah. just disregarded God's word. Mm -hmm. They just started making up their own rules. Mm -hmm. Does that sound familiar? Yes. Yeah. Well, it's scary because with everything going on for us all over in America, let alone the world, especially California, um, I, I know that you probably guys are probably all this way. I mean, I just like beg for mercy because I fear, yeah. fear the Lord. And, like, and I yeah. fear Whoa. the word. Fear the word. That's why yeah. I want to teach this stuff about what filters through from the Old Testament to the New because it goes through the cross and we've got to know. you got to know the whole word. And you know what? When your people are, when you're sensitive to know the word of God and to follow it, He's going to expose it. And then it's up to you whether you're going to be resolved to do it. You know, that's just the way it is. But thank the Lord we get to study together, you know. Yeah. yeah. Okay, then the next desolation is that of the land. Go to verse 32. And he says this, I will lay waste the land 
so that your enemies who live there will be appalled or disgusted with you, okay? The land of Judah was desolated under the Babylonian invasions. The Babylonians, the Babylonians were known to come in and, and raise everything to the ground, cut all the trees down. The trees meant something to God. That's why the Lord, remember back earlier when we talked about um, how the Lord said, there will be a day that I will punish that country for coming in? Yeah. You, you think on one hand, well, that's not really fair because he called Nebuchadnezzar his servant and he told him to go in. Nebuchadnezzar went far beyond the bounds of what the Lord told him to do. They did a lot more than what God ever said. God just said, go and take them out. They bashed the babies up against the wall. They cut the trees down. They did all sorts. They were a human zoo or worse than. They didn't, act, they, didn't, they didn't act like animals that were just hungry. They... What's, you know, they, they devolve lower than animals, and that's us today, okay. too, okay? All right, then the last verse, desolation of the people. Look at verse 33, and then God says this, I will scatter you among the nations and will draw out my sword. Wow, I will draw out my sword and pursue you. Your land will be laid waste and your cities will lie in ruins. Then the land will enjoy its Sabbath years all the time, that it lies desolate and you are in a country of your enemies. Then the land will rest and enjoy its Sabbaths. All the time that it lies desolate, the land will have the rest. It did not have during the Sabbath you lived in it. The Lord redeemed a people. He redeemed his people. And he said, this is the sign between us I am the landlord. I'm giving you a land. I've married you. Now I've given you a place to live. Take care of it. Don't disregard my land and giving it its rest. And he put the land over the people because they didn't heed what the landlord said. Now, it's no different today. A, a landlord has every right to evict for certain things. That's what God did. He evicted them. Right? And so that's what happened. Now that is what I call the fourfold desolation. We will return to that theme because it's going to follow throughout Daniel. Okay, it's a theme that even is functioning today with Israel. We'll get to that way later, but I want you to remember that. Okay, the what? people. Yeah, we're we're going to get to what part? <clears throat> we're going to revisit these four desolations as we continue to go down the timeline, which Daniel brings us to. Okay, you know how I told you that, um, uh, I'm just going to just add this in really quick. Do you know how we talked about how, in the, in the introduction, how we said that Daniel and Revelation are twin books? Yes. yes. Okay. Daniel focuses on the devil's agenda. Revelation focuses on the blessings and curses of God and judgment upon the wicked and the wedding of the Lamb. So because Daniel focuses on the devil's agenda, we're going to see a lot of what goes on on the earth and in the world. And that's what we're going to keep trailing through. Right now, we're before the cross, 600 years, right? Right at the very beginning of Daniel. And Daniel is given so much information about what? The times of the Gentiles. And it's going to bring us right up to today. Okay? These four desolations that God spoke to his people, the Jews will be revisited again as we continue through the timeline. So you'll hear that again. Tonight was just the night where I introduced it, okay? This was the reason for them being kicked out of the land, okay? So the people in Judah were either desolated in captivity or killed in the battle that ensued. And this was the beginning of the seven times punishment of the Lord on his own people for their chosen evils. And to think that they were clearly told. God never, ever, ever left them in the dark to wonder, why is he doing such a thing? We read it right there. There were plenty of warnings, too, that he provided through his prophets over the centuries, beginning with Moses. Then Moses made sure he got them written down in Torah. Right? It wasn't even the oral law. It was the written word of God. And then he sent Isaiah, he sent Jeremiah, and a whole bunch of other what we call minor prophets that went and also warned them over and over. Nope, won't happen. Unbelievable. 
So think about it. The nation had finally been brought out of Egypt by God in 1492 BC. By 606 BC, that's 886 years later, they ceased to be his theocratic kingdom. They just, they, 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 they were no longer one. And in these desolations, the vessels from the temple of God were taken and carried to Babylon. And we see that embedded in the Torah. That that's what would be happening. And he told the thing, um, the, the prophets. Now, once those sacred vessels um, were in King Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, he considered them part of the spoils of war and he put them in Babylon's Temple of Bel. That was their God. Imagine the holy vessels of God from Jerusalem, the city of God, to Babylon, the city of man. From vessels being in the house of the one true God to becoming treasures in the house of a false god named Bel, or the god of the Babylonians. And is all Bel, is Bel, Bel? It's, it, yeah, it's, okay. it's part of Bel. Now you're saying Bel, it, and I'm like, I It don't is know. Bel, it was called Bel, but it also has part of that religion of But it's that B-A-A-L? It's B-E-L, the god of oh, Bel. okay. But it definitely includes that Baal religion, oh, okay? okay? Oh, Go with me, I forgot to tell you this. I want you to see, this was a prophetic word that was given to Isaiah, okay? And uh, let's go there. So that's backwards to the left. Isaiah 39. Now, this is when King Hezekiah, a different king, was on the throne, and Isaiah was sent to Hezekiah. He was sick, God healed him. A whole envoy of Babylonian officials came to check things out. Mm. And Hezekiah didn't give the glory to the Lord. And he showed him all the sacred vessels in the palace and all of this. And just crazy, right? And this is what happened. Oh, this is weird. This is going on. This weird. <laughs> mm -hmm. And Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord Almighty. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your fathers have stored up until this day will be carried off to wow. Babylon. Wow. Nothing will be left, says the Lord, and some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood, who will be born to you will be taken away, and they will become eunuchs mm -hmm. in the palace of the king of Babylon. That's why we know that Daniel and the three guys were made eunuchs. Mm -hmm. The word of the Lord who have spoken is good, Hezekiah replied, for he thought there will be peace and security in my lifetime. Wow, what a leader. Right? Yeah. Right? Babylon represents the city of man, and in a word that would be pride. Jerusalem represented the city of God. Now, the book of Revelation reveals the climax of history concerning these two cities. It speaks of earthly Jerusalem and its corrupted spiritual state before God, which you can go there today and see that. It's very evident. And it speaks of heavenly Jerusalem, the holy, heavenly, and eternal city of God. But Revelation also gives information of Babylon in its final earthly glory and fall and divine judgment. So that in the end, and you know this, only that which is holy and spiritual, heavenly and eternal remains. The new Jerusalem is the city of God. That's the bride city of eternity. That's our inheritance. That's what we're looking forward to, okay? Now, during Daniel's time though, Babylon was at the height of its glory. It was at this point in time, the third world kingdom of human history with relation to the people of God. The Egyptian and the Assyrian empires had almost passed entirely from the scene as world kingdoms. Now, I want you to imagine for a minute Daniel's point of view. Coming from small little Jerusalem, the city of God, now a captive to this magnificent, huge city of Babylon. Remember, that's where the hanging gardens were, the, one of the seven mm -hmm. wonders of the world. Mm -hmm. It was incredible. Can you imagine what it must have been like for him, a 17-year-old maybe? Now, where do we really begin and see the beginning of Babylon? Well, it's way back in Genesis, chapter 10. Babel, 
Do you remember Babel? Do you know that Babel actually originally meant gate of God? Because it wasn't Babel, it was Babylon. That's what that city originally was, Babylon. But then it ended up getting renamed Balal, or you translate it to Babel, which means to confuse. The founder of that city was a guy named Nimrod. Incidentally, his name means the rebel, and he was a descendant of Ham. Nimrod is the 13th from Adam, and that number, 13, speaks of rebellion. And he founded several cities, all of them being evil. His evil kingdom started with Babel, as we know it, Babel. And it continued with the cities of, like, Nineveh, the capital of Assyria. Yeah. And you know the twin cities, Sodom and Gomorrah, they were all evil. Yeah. But Nimrod built a city, a place where the commercial and political nature of people lived together really close. But guess what also he did? He built inside that city a tower. And that tower inside the city represented the religious or the spiritual nature of that city. And so this city with its marketplace and its government and this tower, which was the religion of that city, oh, it made Nimrod a great name. But all of it was done in defiance to God. It was in rebellion against God's word to mankind, which was spread out across the earth. But here in Babel was centralized rebellion against God's word and the purposes for his earth. So in response to man's, let us make a name for ourselves, because that was the focus of Babel, God said, let us go down and confuse the language. And that's when it became Babel rather than Babylon, gate of God. And the building project was abandoned and man, man was scattered across the face of the earth. That was the origin of the nations. So Babylon was just abandoned. But over the years, guess what happened? Babylon slowly again began to rise to power, very slowly. And now we arrive in Daniel's time and it found itself as the greatest world empire under King Nebuchadnezzar. Not called Babel, called Babylon, okay? And it would last in its height for about 70 years, and then God would bring its fall about, as we read. Right. But from the city's original meaning of Babel, of gate of God, to confusion, the principle of Babel or Babylon is very clear. And it's for them, then, and it's for now. And I wrote it down for you. Anything founded mm -hmm. in rebellion ends in confusion, period. Anything, anything founded in rebellion, teach that to your kids, teach that to your grandkids, teach that to young people, teach it. Whether it's against parents, whatever. Mm -hmm. Nations that do that, societies that do that, Individuals that rebel against God and his word become confused spiritually, mentally, morally, and socially. We see that obviously in our nation. Yeah. And it was to this huge city that Daniel and these other three guys were brought as captives. Their faith would be tested. But even here, God would be glorified as the one and only true God of the nations of the earth. And it reminds me of the verse in Psalms that said, Surely the wrath of man shall praise you. And that's what was going to happen. God used Daniel as his prophet to speak to Nebuchadnezzar about Babylon's fall, just as he used the Apostle John to announce the rise and fall of end-time Babylon, at the end of the age in the book of Revelation. So you see, Babylon begins in Genesis, right? In Babel. But it actually ends in Revelation. It rose and fell in Daniel's time. Guess what? It will again rise and fall in the time of Revelation at God's appointed time. Now, even though Nebuchadnezzar was a tyrant, 
a great tyrant. He was an astute man, highly intelligent. And there were various reasons that he looked for the most talented men that he had seized to surround himself with in his kingdom. No surprise at all that he chose from the royal seed of Judah, the most outstanding men to become servants for his evil kingdom. But he realized in choosing those guys that their names would remind them of God. And for Nebuchadnezzar, it was imperative that he get rid of every trace of their God from their thinking, imperative. So he began changing these boys or these young men by changing their names to a name that would speak of his gods. The four Hebrews chosen were Daniel, which means God is my judge, and Hananiah, grace of the Lord, Mishael, which means who is like God, and Azariah, Jehovah has helped. And Nebuchadnezzar changed their names to Babylonian names. Daniel was renamed, as I listed it for you there, Belshazzar, which means keeper of Baal's treasures. Wow, how sad. Mm -hmm. Hananiah was renamed Shadrach, which means inspired by the sun god, and Rach was the name of Babylon's sun god, Shadrach. Mm. Mishael, who is like God, was renamed to Meshach, which is who is like Ak. Shek was Babylon's earth god. And Azariah was named Abednego, meaning servant of Nego. And Nego meant shining fire and was the second dominant god in the Babylonian culture. And we're going to see, as we go through uh, Daniel, that the Babylon, Babylonian culture, they loved fire. We're going to see that. And so there's incredible amount of significance in changing their names because names carry a message for God's people as well as for the Babylonian culture. And names have a spiritual meaning and significance, especially in the mind of the Hebrew as well as the mind of God. The names spoke of the nature, the character, and then even often the office or the ministry of the person carrying that name. And we can read in the Bible where God often gave people their names or he changed their names according to their purposes. Look at Jacob. Jacob means deceiver. Right. But God changed his name to Israel. Yeah. Prince. Right? God's prince. Pharaoh, he changed Joseph's name to an Egyptian name that meant revealer of secrets after he interpreted Pharaoh's dream. Well, the chief steward of the eunuchs in Babylon changed the names of these Hebrew young men. The palace of Babylon wouldn't want servants there who had Hebrew names or anything that would allude to the one true God. Babylon had their own gods and their own special names and meanings identifying the gods that were to be worshipped. So were these four aware of what those names sure, were? Sure, they were so, going to learn. But how, how did they... I'm like someone asked them their name. Did they get that name? Yes, did because they... they were a slave now. They had to go by that name. Yeah, but they knew what it meant. They sure did. And if they didn't, they were going to be put in school to learn about it. Yes. That's hard. And Yes. <laughs> and these names would identify them with the gods of Babylon. But guess what? These name changes never changed their own character. See, here was Nebuchadnezzar's plan to obliterate every trace of these young men's upbringing. They were probably only 17 to 20 years old. They're adolescents. So they sent them to Babylon University for three years to unlearn their heritage. They would now learn the language of Babylon and be trained in all the sciences and arts and religion of that culture so that when they came out at the other end three years later, these four would be Babylonian in thought, thus behavior. The University of Babylon was the same environment of today's university in America. I was just saying yeah. University of totally California. Right here. <laughs> yeah. But here's the beautiful yeah. thing. For sure. For these sure. four never allowed Babylon and its culture to get into them. Mm -hmm. Just like Jesus prayed mm. for us today mm. before he went to the cross that his disciples would be in the world but not of the world. 
And at the end of our age, there's going to come a pressure under the modern day Babylonian system that's going to rise worldwide to receive the mark, the number, or the name of the beast, the final antichrist. And to refuse that mark, number, or name will be to receive the death penalty. Mm -hmm. The spirit of Babylon, confusion, is abroad in the earth today. Why? It's due to rebellion with its Babylonian culture, traditions, customs, festival, the literature that's being uh, changed out, drugs, music, lifestyle. Look at the Houston concert and what happened with all the demonic music. We see it. But guess what? We are called to be like Daniel and his friends who resolved as adolescents or purposed in their heart not to be defiled by the Babylonian culture of their day. And the people of God are called to be overcomers. Amen. But do you realize that that means there's going to have to be something for each of us mm -hmm. to overcome in order to be overcomers? Mm -hmm. And that's trials and testings. Same with them. And it began with food, as we read. Mm -hmm. They would not defile themselves with the king's food or drink, with his meat or his wine. And the word resolved means they made up their mind. They decided on purpose. It was a deliberate decision of the heart and the mind and the will that said, we will not eat it, even if it means death. You see, the food of the Babylonian king was not kosher. And these four men were living under the Mosaic Covenant. So they determined not to touch the unclean thing. There would be absolutely no compromise of God's word standard. There's a word standard. There'd be no compromise to any of it. They would walk out their faith by faith. But you've got to realize that this test was twofold in nature, which means it's going to be twofold in nature for us as well. It was a test of the word and of the spirit. Let me explain. The word side was spelled out clearly in the law for Israel. They were not to eat certain meats. You can read about it in Leviticus 11 or Deuteronomy 14. We know it as the kosher diet. Daniel and the other three chose to stay within the line of the scripture, the logos, the written word. Thus, abstinence was best for them. And that was the standard. It was God's standard, therefore it was their standard. They would not eat Babylonian meat. Okay, I get it. No bacon. That's fine. I get that, right? But what about the spirit test? Why couldn't those Hebrews drink a little wine from the fruit of the vine mm -hmm. why, why couldn't they do that well here's why food and drinks were and still are often often offered to idols and when food or drink are often are offered excuse me there is an association with idolatry and paul deals with this in the new testament writing to the corinthian believers he says the idol itself is nothing there might be an idol that's made of wood or stone or plastic. He didn't say plastic, but I did. <laughs> <laughs> the meat and the drink also, that's just physical. It's no big deal. The problem is, Paul said in Corinthians, when the spiritual and the physical are brought together. When the physical is offered to the spiritual or the demonic. Now you're talking sacrament language. Mm -hmm. And we can't eat of the Lord's table, said Paul, and eat of the table of demons. It was the same for Israel. Israel were forbidden to sacrifice to the gods or eat of their sacrifices. Yet, did you know that Israel had repeatedly done just that? Because they disregarded the law of God. They didn't carry the word standard. That was another reason that they were kicked out of the land. So you see, it's not just the carved, ugly little statue, nor is it just the meat and the drink. It's combining the two in offering to the spirit behind the idol, the food and the drink. And Babylon was founded on their idols. And those Hebrews 
said, we cannot eat or drink to the glory of God, the meat and the wine offered to the Babylonian gods. When we get to chapter 5, we're going to see when Belshazzar, the grandson of uh, Nebuchadnezzar, had a great feast. And he drinks wine out of the sacred vessels from God's house while praising the gods of Babylon. Listen, such behavior brings forth great, great judgment as Corinthian repeats for us now in how we are to partake of the Lord's table. In other words, do you realize what I'm saying here? This concept of Daniel and the three guys that comes through the filter of the cross and it lands us on this side. Those four Hebrew men governed their lives by the word and by the spirit of God, which was the spirit behind the idolatry. They recognized it. The true church will do the same thing. There are many, many spirits today inside and outside the church that are not of God's word or his Holy Spirit. Anything that is not of the word and the Holy Spirit is idolatry. Idolatry will bring deception. Deception ends in judgment. And we're called to be changed into his wonderful image through Christ Jesus. So these four were tried in their diet for 10 days. Now 10, interesting number. It is the number of government for the Hebrews, but you know what? It is also the number of trial and testing and responsibility. You know, as we study, we're going to see a lot of tens in Daniel. There's going to be ten toes on a statue that we're going to study and ten horns on a beast. We know about ten talents in the parables or ten virgins. What about the ten plagues that were sent to Egypt? We know about that. The ten commandments. Why ten days? But it's significant that these four were ten times better than all of the other wise men of Babylon at the conclusion of the 10 day trial on vegetables and water. Mm -hmm. You can read in Exodus that God promised Israel that if they kept the word, do you know what he promised? That it would be health to their flesh if they kept the word standard. That's a physical act with a spiritual effect. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. And the rewards for Daniel and the three others were physical and spiritual. Their physiques were better in appearance than any of the others. The consecration to God with their bodies was confirmed by God with wonderful health. Did they have coffee and chocolate too? <laughs> <laughs> that was the king stuff. They couldn't have it. Yeah. 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 No. <laughs> <laughs> but the Lord blessed them spiritually too because of their commitment to the word standard and the spirit standard God gave these four special knowledge and special wisdom in other words he gave them spiritual gifts to what degree ten times better than all of the other wise men in Babylon that were in the king's service. And Daniel, he was especially gifted with interpretation of dreams, visions, and unknown writings. Now, why did God add these particular gifts to Daniel? Because those are the types of gifts in the Babylonian culture that was highly regarded. Babylon highly regarded dreams and visions, it was paramount in their culture because they believed a great deal in omens and in messages through dreams and visions. And so God said, this is gonna be your main ministry through your lifetime. Academic intelligence was given as well as these type of spiritual abilities and the spiritual gifts, guess what? They're increased in our lives when you go through the fire. Yeah. When you're tested and tried, and through it all, the Lord is not forgotten or disregarded, you're going to come out of that fire with more spiritual gifts mm -hmm. to be used for others. Yeah. Really, that's the main message of the book of Daniel. You've got to realize that through this trial, just the first one, 
Daniel was not thinking short term. He wasn't thinking, well, okay, you know, I'll finish my three years at Babylon University and maybe in year three or four, I'm going to get back to Israel. No, he knew. He was thinking long term. He knew his life would be there. And as an exile that had been made into a eunuch, he offered the Lord his life for a lifetime. I mean, God had told Habakkuk, the just shall live by faith. And Daniel did just that. And you know what? Daniel was still witnessing at 90 years old at the mm -hmm. close of this book. Mm -hmm. From being in the University of Babylon and completing all of the exams with flying colors to being appointed to many positions of responsibility throughout the many years, he and his friends stuck it out, never forgetting the things of God. They never compromised. In closing tonight, I would like to highlight how two stages in life are vital. And I hope you pass this on. It's childhood and adolescence. Childhood is a period when decisions are made for you. When parents tell you what is right and wrong. When standards that the home you've been born into are set for you and your memory is filled with those standards. Daniel and the three other guys, we know just with their given name, tells us that they had godly parents mm -hmm. who knew God and set the right standard for these guys. And thank the Lord if you have had a childhood like that. Mm -hmm. But the second vital key is adolescence. When we begin to decide for ourselves, it's tragic. When a young person who has been given God's standards chooses to simply not go the way of their parents. But how wonderful it is when a child who becomes an adolescent chooses in a hostile environment to say, I'm still going to live like that because I believe it to be right. Mm -hmm. Daniel came through his childhood and was forcibly cut off from his background in every way possible. He was on his own, I believe, even though an adolescent, at an earlier age than normal. Which way would he turn? The answer is, he resolved in his heart to not be defiled, both in word and spirit. And because he would not eat the king's meat or drink the king's wine while still a teenager, the lions wouldn't eat him later when he was 90 years old. Amen? Mm -hmm. That's chapter one. Let's pray. Lord, resolution.